I'm Bruce Cameron alongside Justin Nimmergood. Hello, everyone. Happy Monday. Happy almost uh, uh, tax season and uh, almost time zone, uh, you know, spring forward. It's our last Monday before we spring forward. It is. It is. And uh, Ronan, our, our guest, I think is ready for you to call to, to bring him on if, if, uh, if you're able. So he did text back. So trying to get all of our points connected here today on the on the show. So okay. Hello. literally trying to. All right. There you are. Jose? Yes, sir. All right. <clears throat> well, glad you made it on, man. You know, we'll just kind of roll with it. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, well, good. Uh, well, thanks for coming on the show today. Uh, you know, folks, we have Jose Santana with us. And uh, Jose is uh, a former uh, director of the uh, Designation Sentence Computation Center. The Federal Bureau of Prisons had a very, very high distinction there. And, and, uh, we want to talk a little bit more today on, you know, the federal, uh, the First Step Act, federal prison reform. And, um, and so this is something near, dear, dear and dear to our hearts. And Justin's with us today, Jose. So he'll be, he'll be, he's anxious to learn about all this federal stuff. He's chomping at the bit. To, yeah, I got my notepad ready. and my, my uh, pen ready here. So, um, you know, pretend that I've never learned anything about this because I really haven't. <laughs> And, and uh, you know, I'm I'm probably representative of your cohort uh, audience out there. You know, let's, right. let's learn. Let's, I'm just here to learn and take some notes. So I'm well, looking forward well, to hearing what you have to say here uh, today. And Jose is always he's he's kind of the silent co-host on those times that you're away or on assignment or whatever. So I would, you know, Jose gets the ninth inning call, man, like, hey, man, <laughs> you know, he's the perfect utility. Oh, yeah, he's, like, utility he's definitely my go to number one uh, off the uh, off the bullpen, uh, come, come out uh, on the mound and and, uh, and get the show done. So, well, thanks for coming on the show today, Jose. And uh, well, glad, glad, glad to have glad to help and, and glad to be of assistant, Bruce, you know. We're always here to help and ask the question and answer the question the folks have. Uh, it's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. All right, all right. Also, we sent out a little blast to the Facebook page. So, Ronan, we might be getting some outside callers. So, if we do get any calls today, please put them through and we'll uh, answer their questions. So, uh, a as a recap, so you know, uh, Jose and I have a, um, a business called FederalPrisonAuthority.com and Federal Prison Authority. Uh, dot com is a service that is utilized by defendants, offenders, offender families. But we, um, I, I would say, over half our work, uh, we're retained by attorneys, um, cr you know, criminal defense attorneys to assist with their defendant clients. Um, because the what happens after a person is sentenced, they go into the hands of the Justice Department. They're considered, if you will, almost like the property of the Attorney General of the United States. And uh, yeah, and so that's it. And and you leave the judicial branch and go into the hands of the executive branch. And that is a journey within itself. And um, a lot of uh, offenders and offender families are now coming to recognize through the uh, Second Chance Act <clears throat> what power the Federal Bureau of Prisons has uh, to send inmates home early or get them more home confinement or transitional credit or there's compassionate release programs there's an elderly reduction in sentence program so there's just a lot of mechanisms that the justice department can do on its own so regardless of what the judge said at sentencing because once it goes into the hands of the Justice Department, now it's in the hands of the Justice Department. And then the Justice Department has the authority and the judge really doesn't have much authority as, you know, as, as it kind of plays out. It, it, it's kind of weird because you think the, the judge would always maintain all this authority throughout the person's journey. But not so much in the federal in the in, in the federal world. So what do you have to add to that there, Jose? That was my little nickel abstract. But. Yeah. You're very much right on target, Bruce. You know, that's where the separation of powers of our democracy come into play. The, 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 like you very well said, the judicial branch and the executive branch are separate. And many times families and, and you know, 
just recently convicted individuals don't understand that the judge cannot obligate or mandate the Bureau of Prisons, uh, for example, where to place an inmate, where to transfer an inmate, where what to do with an inmate. It's exclusively uh, statutory given authority to the Bureau of Prisons of what they could do with an inmate. So once they pass on to the Attorney General, they become, like you very well said, um, you know, kind of under the custody, under the subjected to the attorney general's will and disposition, basically. Right. And that's executed through the director of the Bureau of Prisons and 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 down from from that. So and so all the time, you and I clarify questions. As a matter of fact, you and I, Jose, had a call with a, a, a possible incoming client about. Uh, the expanded home confinement program for elderly and how that individual, right. remember that individual was double calculating the first time back and double calculating. Yeah. What, what was he doing? He was double calculating the good conduct time or what was he doing? Well, right. He was double dipping like we call it, Bruce. So basically, you know, he had a 33 month sentence, white collar offender for bank fraud. And the individual was telling his loved one um, that, he he was calculating off the release date that the bureau already had calculated, which was uh, a December 2021 um, release date. I'm not going to mention the specific date, but he took off the 54 days, which was about 11 months, uh, give or take, uh, from that sentence. Uh, no, it was actually it wasn't 11 months. He was he was miscalculating even the math. It, it was about um, almost five months that sentence 15 percent uh, okay. so he was miscalculating the math he was miscalculating the adjustment on the computation Ooh. which was he was taken off the 11 months out of his release date of 2021 which That's puts him good. about more or less at the end of this year which was incorrect so he was hoping he was going to get six months out of halfway house too so that was also um, incorrect because that's not the right uh, amount of time for a 33 month sentence, which was, you know, by the first step back, you could get up to six months uh, difference from the second chance at which we'll, we can discuss later. So, uh, yeah, he was he was getting his family's hopes up and and unfortunately he was incorrect. Yeah. And then the, the particular geographic region that he's releasing to is he's going to have to be, uh, you know, monitored under uh, probably federal probation but the good news is going directly to the house but monitored under federal probation which will have its own nuances and things to 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 go through but anyhow that's just a moment in our lives folks you know that's just one particular kind of case so what uh what jose and i wanted to do was kind of this is kind of our 2019 in review uh talk yeah uh, yeah <clears throat> talk about some of the cases we we had worked with very successfully and uh jose i i, I didn't get you the list but i typed it out for myself <clears throat> so i'll be able to do some keywords and i think you'll pick up on on who who it is yeah almost here we go so our first one uh miss santana is uh, the elderly gentleman <clears throat> that uh, uh came to us uh and uh, had a lot of uh, medical concerns, um, and had a had a, had yeah. a sex offense background. Sex offense background. So go ahead and give the overview on that, sir. So it was it was particularly interesting. This case, elderly gentleman, eighty plus, late eighties, um, going to prison because of of child abuse and exploitation, traditionally called child pornography, which is not the correct term, but um, child abuse, child exploitation. And he had some minor child engaging in sex in the computer. Uh, it was not a contact offense, right? And so he went to prison, was sentenced to prison, um, and he had a lot of medical issues. Uh, of course, at that age, he had... He was a care level three, and actually, we were we assisted the family um, to get him to a medical facility here in the Metroplex, and he went there uh, for his conditions. His conditions were stabilized, and he wasn't chronic anymore. They took him to outside hospitals, stabilized his conditions and everything, gave him the proper medical care, and then we were able to successfully assist the family also to getting him to a uh, general population facility, low security 
uh, close to the Metroplex so the family could still go visit him and everything. And after that, uh, he completed his, um, almost at the end of his sentence, he was able, we were able to get uh, release reentry center placement close by uh, for this sex offender, which is traditionally uh, was back in the day, it was unheard of that sex offenders would go um, to a release reentry center uh, in the Metroplex. So it, it's a lot of the first step back things have changed the way cases are looked at. And we have been very successful in, in assisting families. And the Bureau of Prisons has really worked well with, with, with us and with the attorneys to get them to where we need. That was our first, first success case. Well, under the first I, act. Right. And, I, and on this particular case, uh, with my sex offender training and psychological training, I did a risk assessment on him. The original guideline for him, because of the, the number of images, was around 327 months was the top of his guideline. And, mm -hmm. uh, and he had a tough, a tough judge here in Eastern District. And we were able to get that down to double-digit months based on the risk assessment. <clears throat> so uh, that brought his guideline down. And the judge did at least decide to sentence him in the lower part of the range. And uh, and then everything else transpired, like you said there, Jose. So, yeah, that was a good and, and Bruce, Bruce is being humble about it, but he really worked with that case on, on getting with the attorney and getting the people, the, the, the people to understand the type of case it was and the needs of this offender um, and getting them down to the lower part of the sentencing guidelines. So you did a fabulous job there, Bruce. Thank you. Thank you very much. It doesn't happen often, but uh, man, that was a that was a, a great full service case from the assessment work all the way to the finish out with the uh, placement and getting close to home. So fantastic work, work there. And, and again, man, it, it was a collaborative effort. And um, me and you are corresponding on that years ago, if you know what I mean. So um, yeah, at a distance. So we uh, that was a, that was amazing. Well, our next case. Is, a, is an interesting one from the East Coast. Uh, this is an individual around the Massachusetts area that went directly uh, that through our efforts was to go from the federal prison directly into a home confinement um, center. Is that enough of a clue for this fellow? Yeah, yes, Bruce. And, and okay. interesting in that case is that he had a very short sentence, very short sentence, which with the First Step Act, also he was able to um, get that our assistance and review that was part of, of one of the few first case that we were successful on Bruce on getting them halfway house and getting them getting them out halfway house direct direct home confinement direct electronic monitoring placement and actually he was released a couple of months ago from from everything so uh, I finished the sentence short very short sentence the family wanted our assistance in getting transferred remember that Bruce getting him transferred uh, closer to the upper uh, upper northeast, um, right. and based on the short sentence, he wasn't going to be transferred. Um, we were successful in getting him uh, reviewed for direct home confinement. So um, and, that was a very and, good case on a very short time. Right. So here we have a, an offender with a short sentence actually gets some first step at first step act benefit from that and mm -hmm. then gets a direct home confinement placement man he goes yes. straight to his yes. house unbelievable yes. so the other this, this case is fairly unbelievable in that the first case was a sex offender getting all these benefits excuse me and then now this case being a short timer uh getting a direct home confinement thing and folks don't think if you're listening to this program don't think that's going to happen to your loved one because that just happens to be he, he released to an area of the Northeast that had a direct home confinement contract in play. Mm. If you're in Moline, Illinois, or Cornfield, Iowa, or Laramie, Wyoming, that ain't going to happen. You know what I mean? <laughs> but but uh, but, the, the, but but where but where this guy happened to live, he was able to access those services that was right in place. And, and again, Jose, that that one's a big win for you. Uh, you know, uh, riding herd and, and keeping. Uh, keeping that dream alive so good job there well our next one is uh boy this was interesting uh this i think this is one of our quickest cases i was in uh, uh somewhere uh southern california laguna beach and then that we uh, i was calling you on the phone and uh, this yeah. individual was uh this individual was 
was slated to go to an to an institution that wasn't necessarily the uh, the best fit, but uh, what that thing you, you you helped get that thing turned around uh, to to a good to a good institution here in Southern Texas, if you know what I mean. Is that is that enough of a clue word? Yes, that 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 case was the individual that was serving a pretty lengthy sentence had already served 10 years on the sentence and he was being transferred to from a low security to a minimum security facility. What happened was he was um, the family contact us, the attorney contact us and said, hey, they sending him somewhere else further away. He's been 10 years away from the family. Can you guys assist us in trying to get him closer so he could have visiting? And so we did, we looked at it and we said, let's see what we could do. Um, we contacted um, individuals that, that we work with us and, and they reviewed the case and they said, you know, you're right. And we should, we should give them a consideration to that. And luckily there was available bed space in this facility. Um, and we happened to send them to a minimum security facility in South Texas. So um, it was a quick turnaround. It was almost almost a weekend, and we were able to just turn around that, that individual. Luckily, we were able to because he wasn't moved. He was still at the at the parent facility designated, mm -hmm. but not yet on movement. So we were able to have the case reviewed, and everything was in place um, policy-wise for them to review the case and send them to another minimal security facility closer for his family. Even though it was going to be still probably – uh, maybe a, a few hour drive, two to three hour drive uh, for the family, but it was closer than than the alternative in Mississippi. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you, know? you gave that away, but okay. We, we, yeah, yeah, but, <laughs> months ending yeah. in November, we, Alex. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, you're right. Yeah, good, good stuff there. And that, and again, that was a, a a good thing. You know, folks, a lot of times um, as consultants. We we know what to do because we're the armchair quarterbacks, and of course we we were we were the system, and so you know we lead the horse to water. You know what I mean? Uh, <laughs> you like that? Justin's laughing, man. He's like, you like the armchair quarterback thing? <laughs> yeah, he's feeling that. He's feeling that, and, that, and yeah. it's true. We're we're sitting here in the ivory tower with the jeweler's glass, like this is what what should happen, and and that's why we are retained by attorneys and whatever else, and so we were able to. Uh, alert the appropriate decision makers in a very timely fashion and they got it done within hours and if uh, you had gone with some sort of post-conviction attorney or some god forbid ex-convict shit would never happen yeah bottom line he'd be that guy'd right. be getting his ass beat in a in a medium or whatever so all right then very good sir very good let me depart from our order let's let's change to another popular uh, the cpap person the cpap Want to talk about him? Yes. Sentence? Okay. Yes. Uh, the individual was a white collar offender, received a, a 30, 30 month sentence, and first time offender. He was going to go to a minimum security facility, camp facility. The, the thing about it was his medical challenges. He was. He told me like he was the, like the six million dollar man. His bionic. Um, they had just inserted him one of the newer. Uh, mechanisms for CPAP, which was electronically controlled by a little uh, by a little remote that activated the CPAP um, function when he went to sleep. So he was asking me, asking us, uh, I don't know if you remember the particulars, right, Bruce, but he was asking us if we could send him to a facility that could accept that type of mechanism. No way, the Bureau is not that, that, that up to speed on the electronic uh, medical devices. And so... He, we, we got him to a care level three facility, um, but at a minimum security facility with the assistance of the folks that reviewed the case appropriately. And um, he took the mechanisms and the machine and everything else with him, but it wasn't a, he wasn't able. I found out through his attorney that he wasn't able to, to use that type of device. Um, Did we go but, through OMDT on that? We were able to go through regular designation channels or whatever. Was that, do we have to consult? No, OMDT, OMDT review the case. Because if you remember that case, Bruce, the judge had adamantly uh, and strongly worded the judge the recommendation in the judgment and commitment, saying um, a facility that provides for his CPAP machine requirements. Um, 
but you know the bureau couldn't provide CPAP machines, and they inmates do have CPAP machines, but not up to like the six million dollar man. All righty then. So uh, I was doing a little behind the scenes, uh, telling uh, Justin what OMDT is. You want to share with our listeners what OMDT means, Jose? The Office of Medical Designations and Transportation, man. Just so you get a feel for okay. any 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 case that goes to federal prison is reviewed for medical needs, and for medical uh, care levels, there's a care level system which it's it provided by a medical calculator, which assigns numbers. The inmate's conditions give them a number. So care level one would be an Arnold Schwarzenegger, a healthy individual. Care level two will be a guy like like normal guy who has uh, controlled uh, diabetes or controlled diabetes. blood pressure. Yeah. Uh, well, care level three would be a more chronic um, care. And care level four, if the individual is outside in the free world, they would be in a hospital, hospitalized, or requiring continuous assistance yeah. with daily living functions. Um, that would be a care level four. So the designation of census computation center, which is the DSCC, will designate the place of confinement for care level ones and twos. Care level threes and fours will be the Office of Medical Designation and Transportation, OMDT. So okay. they, they classified initially, they'll go to that OMDT office and they will review it. But this guy was a care level three. He was uh, Originally, he was a care level three because of his condition. But once reviewed by the Office of Medical Designation, OMDT, it came down to be a care level two. So he went to uh, where we advocated for uh, his review and placement, and he's happy where he's at. Yeah, and so <clears throat> so for our listeners and possible customers and attorneys and beyond, if you, if you do have a if, if if you do have a client that you're giving us, and that client has a significant medical condition, it's going to require that extra step of us consulting with our medical experts, possibly, and then looking through the lens of the OMDT team because that's a it's a it's a little bit different paradigm how how we look at those things but uh, because because basically you know care level threes and fours are specialized cases so it takes more effort all right all right very good sir very good let's go with our next case very exotic um yes it's very exotic exotic women (laughs) yeah well (laughs) This is exotic. It's not in that respect at all, but it, it, it's exotic in that it involves attorneys from uh, various countries, at least three that I can think of. And, uh, you know, uh, this person, uh, yeah. is, that, is that enough of a clue there for you there? Okay. Oh, yes, absolutely. Uh, okay. Go, <laughs> well, go ahead and explain this case to, to our listeners, uh, Jose. You're, you're best yeah, for this. This case. Is interesting in the fact that it goes to deal with the um, uh, cases of terror, terror, terrorism. Um, this individual was sentenced uh, a plea agreement. If he would have went to trial, he probably would have gotten life in prison. Um, it involved that he was uh, supposedly funneling money or supporting terroristic activities. Uh, he was a successful businessman internationally multi-million dollars, it went up to the billions. Um, and the individual had some medical issues, which the attorneys abroad and the attorneys from the U.S. wanted him to go to a medical facility um, in the north, uh, mid, north mid, mid, kind of mid, mid-Atlantic part of the country. And um, they, they wanted him to get medical attention. So the case comes to us, and for that specific reason, and we looked at the case and classified him, but um, he was going to be placed in a higher facility based on the sophistications and the classifications of security on this case. And we were able to get the proper authorities reviewed. Um, the individual had already, um, he's, he's not a U.S. citizen, um, born abroad, and so 
he was going to be placed in a higher security base because he was not a non-U.S. citizen and the particular security matters that concern the case uh, of the monetary uh, quantities involved there. So we got him to uh, not the medical facility because he didn't meet uh, the requirements of a, of a care level three, like we explained before. So he was uh, considered a care level uh, two medically and a care level one for mental health. He, was, he had no mental health issues. And so we were able to get the case review in a system and getting placed in a facility which was uh, appropriate for his range in security. They didn't give him uh, uh, an enhanced security management um, placement because we, we were able to have the, the decision makers review the case and they agree with us that this guy didn't surface to that to that uh, extreme security measures. And so he was placed in a facility to measure it with his appropriate security, uh, just one level less of the enhancement. And he is doing his uh, sentence there. And for the most part, he's okay. We got him to get, see re, see them, um, the, the, the facility there, see his uh, medical needs. And actually he was taken out to the community hospitals there and reviewed and He's getting the appropriate uh, medical care um, that the Bureau could provide, even in the community hospital. So that was a very successful case, very involved, very, very challenging, very sophisticated case. Very, yeah, <clears throat> you're, you're right. And, and, and that is just, um, you know, Ho Jose, you just did the great heavy lifting on that one, particularly uh, the interagency uh, aspect of this, different countries involved. Uh, different sets of attorneys involved, different countries, <clears throat> different uh, different cultures. You know, it's a multicultural thing. So, um, so yeah, that that was a, a great case. And what were you gonna actually, say? Bruce, I don't know if you remember that um, we also were contacted because he had he was arrested abroad by the uh, federal um, task force team in uh, in the country abroad, and he was detained for. Some time there, and he wasn't getting the jail credit for that. Um, so we That's were able right. to get the case uh, reviewed, and they assisted us, and they assisted, and he got the credit. Actually, they, the the letter which references his detain his his detention and the time he was detained abroad was written in 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 Arabic, and we had to translate it. It was translated by. Uh, a certified translator, and we had to submit those documents to the Bureau of Prisons, to the, the designation sense computation center. They got to review it. It took them several months, but he got the credit for that. So that was a that was an excellent excellent coordination among us and and the attorneys. Yeah, good good save there. Yeah, I remember that, and that was a that was a wonderful thing. You know, we took this piece by piece. You know this. This, this case is very complex, and so uh, thank God we had the wisdom and discernment to, to write retainer agreements for each each piece, you know what I mean? And then yeah. we could track the work, and it keeps us accountable, and it shows to them, hey, this is done. We're moving on to the next issue, next retainer. And so um, awesome, awesome job there, uh, Jose, and we'll continue to, to monitor that. Since we're on the, the topic of... Uh, let's say non-U.S. citizens, let's, let's pick one more non-U.S. citizen. Um, one, we don't have anybody from Spain. Justin, Justin wants a, a Spaniard, but we're, we're fresh out of those today. Oh, he wants to hear the Castilian list or something. Well, Jose's Puerto Rican. So we can, oh, Puerto Rican. Yes, yes, <laughs> Jose, if you know anything about the Catalan bar, that would be of interest. You know, think about that? Of which one? Which Catalan. One? The Catalan law, like the, the Castilian. Catalan, law, Catalan, 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 All right, well, our next case on the, uh, on our show today is an individual that had a separate tea. They weren't a U.S. They were not a U.S. citizen, and um, albeit in the country a long time, and uh, their separate tea 
unwittingly we found out in the beginning thank god we were hired in the beginning we found out that they were designated to the same place that their co-defendant was going and that wasn't a good thing you know who i'm talking right. about okay Absolutely. go ahead go ahead and finish that one up so these individuals were um sentenced they both pled guilty uh separately they were both lined up to testify against each other and oh, so they were both school. both cases were lined up one to testify against the other in the conspiracy and the kickbacks for health uh services and health providers health care provide providers and they didn't get to testify against each other but oh, one of them yeah. is designated oh, first to a facility in the southeast of texas and the other one ends up being designated to the same place. And so um, the attorney uh, didn't know that this was happening, but the fact that the family got involved and the individual got involved um, and called us and provided the, the information, we were able to reach out to our contacts in the bureau, provide the information, verify the information, and get them um, designated get our our client designated elsewhere because if not it would have been ugly um it would have provided a safety and security issue for those inmates for the staff involved and consequently one of them was going to be transferred and put in a bus and detained somewhere and go from location to location from from the special housing unit in that facility um probably through oklahoma city uh, wait for there for another bus or a plane to get out to the designated place of confinement. We were able to avoid all that uh, by making several calls and contacting our individuals and providing the, the correct information. The attorney didn't know what to do. If you remember, Bruce, when we talked to him, he said, I don't know what to do. I'm on a little awesome. What to do? I said, well, we got this. That's why we, we were retained and we got this and we took care of it. Um, even afterwards, he got involved with the prosecutor, provided the letter, and corroborated our statement. But they were already designated elsewhere. So, wow. yeah, so I mean, cool. can you imagine? Yeah, you're this otherwise white collar offender, you know, thinking you're going to report to a, a minimum security institution, but yet your code defense there. Next thing you know, man, you're in shackles and chains. Like you said, man, you might as well be a medium or whatever, right? You're going here, you're right. going there. You're going to be on the chain gang, I'm on the bus, be smelling diesel, going to Oklahoma City, you know, making a run there and be just, I mean, what? So we spared that individual pretty much a horrendous experience of Corrections 101 <laughs> with uh, with U.S. Marshals, buses, planes, and, and, then, and, and then being sent wherever in automobiles, right? So, and, and it's at that moment the BOP can say, hey, we got to keep our institutions safe. And so if we have a bed for you in uh, Safford, Arizona or whatever, you know, Lompoc, then that's where you're right. going, even though it's more than 500 miles. So, but luckily this individual was quickly uh, redesignated to a place close to his home and is living happily ever after. Folks, and again, just make sure all this stuff is all past tense. So, uh, you know, don't be trying to uh, piece our stories together and and start googling newspaper articles because we're we're still <laughs> obscuring the <laughs> we're obscuring the yeah. innocent here or the guilty as, right. as the case may be. All righty then. Right. So we had and on that case, what? on yeah. that case, mm -hmm. Bruce, he, he this we're talking about a, a medical doctor, uh, a doctor in medicine. Right. He wasn't used to you know this type of going to prison stuff, you know. First time uh, ever going, getting in trouble, and we spare him a lot of the, the pains and tribulations. Anguish. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mental suffering, like pain and suffering and mental anguish. Yeah. Personal injury yeah. stuff that we he was spared. All righty then. Real quick, I think our last uh, non-citizen case of the day we'll talk about is an individual who, I think it was a hybrid sentence. It was six months in, in the in BOP in six months, possibly in, in home confinement. But, uh, yeah. uh, and, and this, again, this person, um, was kind of blind to the fact that, uh, Hey, if you're not a U.S. citizen and, um, if other things aren't, uh, taken care of, 
uh, once the Federal Bureau of Prisons uh, gets you, you're going to be treated like a non-U.S. citizen. Uh, talk a little bit about that, because uh, this this individual is uh, possibly slated to go to a ICE Immigration Custom Enforcement uh, uh, facility, possibly on the Canadian border. Uh, had we not jumped in there, you want to talk about that case a little bit? Yes, absolutely. You know I'm talking that's, about okay. that's accurate. Accurate. Six months sentence for prison. Six months sentence for uh, home detention. Uh, the individual was a professional, actually, um, in the technological world, and his case was a misdemeanor, Bruce. If you remember, he right. accessed uh, on un- unauthorized IT system. And so he was a, it was a misdemeanor within even a felony. And so this, this guy was a permanent resident alien with a green card. He wasn't illegal in the country. He was permanently uh, a resident alien with a green card. And regardless of the status, if you are not a U.S. citizen or naturalized citizen, um, you, the, you are going to be reviewed by ICE when you, when you come to the, uh, custody of the attorney general for uh, service of a sentence under the Federal Bureau of Prisons. You will be um, reviewed by ICE regardless of that. So that was the issue. The individual thought he was going to go to a minimum security facility, and that was not the case uh, on, 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 that, on this event. So, But we were able to avoid, uh, again, the, the pain, mental anguish, and the family uh, separation and we kept them, we were able to contact our individuals and re- get the case reviewed for placement in a facility uh, here in Texas, uh, because the family is in Texas. Absolutely, absolutely. Just another another extremely happy uh, customer, uh, and their, their family is uh, grateful that they're able to uh, have their loved one uh, nearby. Well, let's let's kind of turn our attention to individuals that get in trouble while they're in federal prison. One of my favorites is an individual who is probably at one of the best minimum security club fed joints known to man in the Florida area. Nudge, nudge, wink, wink, Jose. Right. Right. And this person right. Had, had, OK. And this person had racked up some pretty serious incident reports for possession of contraband and. Um, and th- this guy could have got sent to the to the furthest reaches of China or whatever because of disciplinary issues. So if you want, jump in and kind of tell our listeners about that case. Right. He was going to go to somewhere where there was best space and it wasn't in Florida. That's for sure. And he was going to go to another part of the country because he had a 20. He has a 2038 release date. Um, so. You know, even though he has, uh, he was at, at at Club Fed there and whatnot. Uh, so the issue here is uh, 2028 release date. I'm sorry, 2028. And so the issue here was he got in, in to incident reports, disciplinary conduct, and um, not only once, twice for the same issue. And we could have saved them if it would have been once, but. Uh, just the second time is too much for a minimum security facility. And so we got him to go to a low security facility and kept him in, in the, the great state of Florida, uh, where his family could go visit him uh, just a few hours away, uh, drive uh, from where they lived, the, where they live. And the individual was placed because of our, our assistance, getting the case review at the proper time, because it was a matter of time that he would, he had already been looked at, the case had already been looked at and being considered to be placed away. And so we were able to intervene um, promptly, um, expeditiously, and they appropriately put him in a place uh, at least close to the family where the family could go drive and visit him. Yeah, another another extremely happy family. Uh, we saved the day there again as well. Well, let's look at an old law case. Yeah, they're, they're, believe it or not, mm-hmm. right? There's, there's the old law uh, parole cases. And this, uh, this is a gentleman that uh, I guess was kind of missing in action, right? And then was, uh, uh, let's talk about him, if you know who I'm talking about. 
Well, it, just to kind of uh, explain a little bit of, of the old law and new law, and, and bottom line is old law cases are any anyone who went to prison before October 31st, 1987, which was the old law parolable case. Uh, starting November 1st, 1987 was the new law, which eliminated parole for all federal offenses, um, which was the uh, statutory uh, uh, crime reform. So that's the difference. So this guy was old law because he committed this crime before October 31st, 1987, um, way before that. Uh, it was a drug offense. And the fact was that this guy was uh, on at large for uh, absconded from, from supervision and didn't surrender himself to uh, serve his time. And he was out at large for 10 years. For 10 years, he was, um, you know, not, not serving his sentence. So we got um, consulted by the attorneys and the attorneys didn't understand how to navigate the all law cases. We were able to do an assessment, classify him according to the salient factors of the old law, which gives him point system. And um, he was, he was, uh, we did a, a preliminary uh, classification and we explained to the attorneys what to expect during the hearing and, and what um, the parole situation was going to be. And so it, it went right on, on point and they reviewed the case and actually they didn't um, really uh, enhance any of his, uh, of his past, behavior of absconding from supervision um, because he was an elderly gentleman. Uh, he had not committed any more crimes since then. And so we got him to, to stay where he was. And actually here maybe in two or three more months, he'll be considered for uh, revision and possibly transferred closer um, to where he wants to relocate to in the great state of Florida. So another successful case of our review and, and assisting attorneys and loved ones to uh, understand the, the system, which all law doesn't, there's, there, when I left the Federal Bureau of Prison December of 2017, there was only 500 uh, old law cases uh, in, in the whole Bureau of Prison. Right. And, and with us being uh, the age we are in our collective, uh, nearly 60 years of correctional BOP experience collectively, you know what I mean? We, we, we remember these yeah. old law cases and these interim hearings, and uh, it was a, just a blessing to, to, to be able to, uh, to help that family out with our uh, knowledge of uh, what the parole commission has dwindled oh. down into <laughs> and what we can what we can do yeah. moving forward i know we have a, a few minutes left and and uh, last uh, case uh, you know uh, is uh, a, a case that was uh, referred to me in the beginning uh, through the community uh, the individual was uh, part of a, a 20 person ish uh, uh, case uh, on, on various levels of fraud, the person came to me for an assessment. Uh, they did qualify and uh, for the RDAP program, uh, but moving forward, uh, 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 this individual retained us to do uh, help with the PSR, the pre-sentence report, and um, this person's attorney actually being a former federal prosecutor, uh, the very, very great collaborative experience we had working with, uh, the private attorney who really, uh, allowed us to take the lead in many respects on, on the social aspects of the case. And of course now the custody of the case, but, uh, uh, as a matter of fact, when the pre-sense report was being conducted, uh, you and I were sitting at the grill, and uh, the, uh, the attorney was actually sitting on the floor uh, with his legs crossed with a legal pad, yeah. taking notes because we didn't have a, we didn't have much room in this jail cell uh, that we were all stuffed yeah. into, and uh, we were able to 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 get this case uh, written up correctly. And 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 uh, Jose, what kind of chime in about 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 this case? This is a kind of a an all-star uh, case for us. Go ahead. Absolutely. This is a white collar medical um, fraud case, uh, which was uh, the individual uh, was going to receive a sentence of 60 months. The thing about it was the interesting fact was that he had been in custody for over almost two years uh, on pretrial custody because he was 
he was under pretrial services and committed another offense while he was on pretrial services. And so they took him in custody. And by the time he got sentenced and he, his computations still haven't been done, Bruce. Um, and so he is short. I mean, you have to have at least more or less 36 months remaining to serve in order to get you to a residential drug abuse program, the RDAP program, which gives inmates up to one year off their sentence if they complete that RDAP program, plus they get six more months in halfway house and transitional services in, in the community. So the time was at the essence on this case, and actually he was going to be designated to a facility that had no RDAP. Um, and we were able to get our contacts, uh, uh, review the case, check the case, and look at it and appropriately designate him to an RDAP site. So this was a stellar case where communication was vital between the attorney, um, the inmates, and actually the Bureau of Prisons did a very, very good job in in uh, looking at the case <coughs> and determining that, because he was designated to a place that had no RDAP. And, and then we got him to review the case Initially. based on the merits Initially, of it and, yes. that, and his qualifications to get him to an RDAP site. So that was a, a success all the way around. Yeah, huge success because then we were able to contact the individual and say, hey, wait a minute, look at the judgment commitment order, look at page such and such of the pre-sentence report, he qualifies for the RDAP, he needs an RDAP interview immediately, he needs to be placed in a prison close to his home, etc., and it worked out just perfectly, and uh, and then, you know, uh, as, a, as a personal aside, you know, the, 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 the inmate would never, you know, like, okay, this is going to happen, just have trust in us. And, uh, well, the, the inmate rumor is this, and this person said that, and the unit secretary said this, and the case manager said that, and I was about ready just to, you know, completely disown this guy. But, of course, what we said did come true, as it always does. And, uh, you know, so, again, folks, you can't rely on inmate.com and BS and rumors and all this other stuff. Uh, you got to rely on the experts who, who, you know, anyway, that I don't know how this knows how this works well we're inside two minutes jose man thanks for coming on the show today that was a pretty good smattering of some of the successful cases we had uh, uh cleared uh, for uh, last fiscal year so uh, man and there's many more <clears throat> by the way folks <clears throat> and I'm, there's like three three more we didn't get to even for that and and and, and many more uh and, and beyond uh, with just extra halfway house placements, uh, extra months of halfway house, <clears throat> and then uh, other miracles with people that get in trouble with the DHO and or, or gang related issues, uh, stuff like that. But we don't have time for that today. But man, thanks for coming on the show and and uh, feel free to see our our page at federalprisonauthority.com and there's a little sub page who we are. And uh, you click that, that has that brings up Jose's picture and his bio and his stellar training and experience. And, um, you know, Jose's very humble as well. He's trained as an attorney. And uh, but we are prison consultants. We don't pr practice law. Uh, we 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 practice prison consulting. And uh, although <laughs> there's a lot of law involved, isn't it? Isn't that right, Jose? Oh, absolutely. And it's federal. You know, we get a lot of uh, we get some calls and uh, issues from state. A state um, family that has loved ones in state prisons, but always f practices federal prison consulting. So uh, feel free to ask any questions. Uh, it would be interesting to have a Q&A section, Bruce, uh, with, the, with with your Facebook group um, and and have some questions yeah. on. on Actually, yeah, we're, we're yeah we will do a we'll do a Facebook live and some other stuff. You're right, Jose. Thank you. And again, come to yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Good save, brother. Yeah, come to our Facebook page at Federal Prison Authority. No, excuse me. First Step Act Federal Prison Reform. First Step Act Federal Prison Reform. Our email and Jose's email is Federal Prison Authority BOP at gmail.com. And uh, you can reach us if you're interested in federal prison consulting services or you have a question about your loved one in federal prison because it's a maze. It's a labyrinth, and even the First Step Act is just a, a huge maze of its own, and it takes a village to navigate through us. So don't do it alone. Retain us to help you. 
we're the gift that keeps on giving. So, uh, all right, Mr. Santana, well, good to have you on the show. We'll bring you on here in a few weeks. Folks, thank you very much.